All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about industrial engineering and applying the stuff we learned last week of material and energy balances to that. Uh, both myself and our guest speaker tonight are uh, industrial, well, she's an industrial engineer and we both work in manufacturing, so without further ado, I'll introduce my now wife, Amy Heinz. Hi, I'm Amy. Um, I have been an industrial engineer for Intel for the last 15 years. Um, I just recently switched jobs into, now my job title is an IT solution analyst, um, but I will roll into kind of how all my industrial engineering knowledge is still needed, um, even in my current role. Uh, so to kind of go right into what industrial engineering is, um, is it's pretty much continuous improvement. So companies will hire industrial engineers because they want you to find inefficiencies. Um, you need to track the data and then figure out how to improve it, essentially. So essentially, the company wants you to save them money. Uh, so the continuous improvement cycle is huge for industrial engineering. Um, you kind of do it constantly, which is why it's a cycle. Uh, so at Intel, um, you have to start somewhere, right? So you want to start with analyzing and understanding what's currently going on on the floor today to determine where you have bottlenecks, where you have capacity constraints, where you're having issues on your manufacturing line. Um, it can also be in a service industry, um, doing layouts for restaurants, um, can all use industrial engineering background knowledge. Because the service industry, if you think a call center, right, they still they need to know how many people they need to staff. Nursing as well. Um, there's a lot of healthcare stuff for industrial engineers because they want to know how many nurses they need on staff based on the demand that may or may not come in, right? So based on forecasted demand of how many people come into the ER on Thursday nights, right? They want to make sure that they're staffed appropriately. Um, An industrial engineer can easily do that. Uh, so first you have to understand what's going on. So whatever process you're trying to analyze and improve, you have to understand what's happening today um, and be able to pick out where there's inefficiencies. Right, so once, oops. oh, sorry, I thought I hit the button twice. <laughs> uh, once you've kind of figured out what's happening, you need to map it out, right? That's the modeling and planning stage. So um, you need to like observe and document everything that you've seen uh, into some sort of model that can help you forecast out what you need. Right? So at Intel, what I used to do until recently was I used to determine the amount of manufacturing equipment that Intel needed for any given technology process that they were manufacturing. So here in Oregon, we're the technology development site. Uh, so we're always the first ones to run the latest and greatest technology. So what we do is we learn how to mass produce it and then we send that knowledge out to all the rest of Intel manufacturing sites um, to kind of copy what we're doing to mass produce Intel's chips. Uh, so for that, I would have to figure out how the tools run on the floor so I can determine how many I might need depending on however much demand they tell me they want us to run. Right, so from modeling and planning, you get your model good to go. So it's planning out exactly like how that tool runs and can map out how many then you need once you put in the demand. So that's how you can then have your decision action, right, of determining for my old job how many tools Intel needs to manufacture their next technology. Right. So once you have that all done, you might think you're done. Great, perfect, done. Not really the case. You still always have to reevaluate that process and we have to reevaluate the equipment and how is it actually running on the floor once we get it up, right? We bought this, we bought all this manufacturing equipment with an assumption that it was going to run a certain way. You need to make sure that it's actually running that way and the metrics match to what you forecasted, right? Otherwise, you're not going to have enough equipment. So say in your model, you thought that a tool would be available 90% of the time. 90% of the time that it could be up and running, it's up and running. But in actuality, it needs a lot more maintenance or it goes down regularly and really your availability is only 70%. Like that's definitely gonna impact how much you can get through that piece of equipment. Um, 
So then it may mean you need to buy another piece of equipment if you can't get that availability up. Right, so then the cycle kind of like re establishes itself, right? Every time you find a bottleneck, you find something inefficient with the process. Uh, you have to analyze it, figure out what the problem is, figure out what the underlying problem is, and then come up with a solution for the company that's cost effective, right? For everything, you can't always say that we can just buy more, right? Because no company has an infinite budget, right? Um, so how that rolls into my new system analyst role is um, I now own essentially a model, a software that um, was created inside of Intel uh, for essentially this, exactly what I was doing before. <laughs> um, and it determines how many tools you need uh, based on an optimization that it does. So Intel's manufacturing process is incredibly um, difficult and it has thousands of steps for any one technology. And as we get, as we try to make smaller and smaller chips, it, everything's just getting more and more um, complicated, right? So the tools we have to buy, and the tools get more expensive as well, right? So the tools we have to buy have to become more modular, like we add chambers that can run different technologies, different layers, versus buying a whole new tool, like a whole new platform, whole new tool to only run a couple, a couple of wafers, right? So you need to, which then that just makes all of our calculations much more complicated, and they're all dependent on potentially multiple different process lines that Intel wants to run. Um, so what Intel created was an optimization model um, which is owned in-house, and now that's what I own. That's harder to see than I thought it would be. Um, essentially, that's the header of it. It's going to kind of go through more of it, but you can't see it that well. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so essentially, that's like the main space people would be in is in the workspace. Um, but like the MOR, that section is all the metrics. That's all the data that I used to collect in my old job that it's all housed in there now. So they still all collect it and then they give it to us to put in this model. Um, roadmap is your demand. So essentially whatever demand is forecasted. Uh, the workspace is where you do all the dawdling, essentially, and how you can change stuff. And then it talks to other systems. So I'm just gonna show you, to make it easier, the tool fulfill plan. Um, so I made this very generic. This is not Intel, but this is what it looks like. To be clear, uh, there's no confidential information being shared is what she means. Yes. <laughs> and I, it's, all, it's widgets, and so it's totally different. But um, so if you kind of imagine, so what the output of the model is, so all those inputs go in of what I used to do, right, um, into the tab. And then there's an optimization model behind the scenes that's all programmed um, this interface as well as the optimization models all programmed within my team uh, and then we're always looking for uh, within my role I look for efficiencies things that we can change to make it better for the user um, as Intel's manufacturing lines get more complicated uh, we have to change the model and the optimization in the interface to accommodate it uh, so I kind of work on that role now so still efficiency based um, but I great that I understand how all of the equipment works already. Um, it helps a lot with my team because I'm the one with the biz more business knowledge side of it. Um, but so essentially what pops out is all the information you would ever need. So the top, it tells you essentially what, what's your demand, what demand you're planning for in the model. Uh, so that up there would be like how many widgets you're going to make of widget one versus widget two over time. Right, and then it tells you you have two types of tools that can run widget one and or widget two, uh, and how many you need of each one. So FTQ is fractional tool quantity, whole tool quantity. Um, but then the system also pulls in from another system within Intel that pulls in the actual inventory that you have on your floor and or planned in your system. So if you have something uh, in procurement that's not installed yet, it still accounts that, okay, you have that piece of equipment. Uh, and then it'll essentially tell you, so this one is perfect, this whole bottom part is for deltas. So anywhere where, if you were to change things and you had one too many pieces of equipment, 
for that widget or one too few, it would pop up in these bottom two rows. Um, and then this is how, like I kind of tried to do some examples. This is the first one. It starts with widget one, but then you can see widget one stops over time. So then they actually convert it in the end there to use it for widget two, which is also very important to a, a company, right, is converting tools versus buying brand new tools because that saves them a lot of money. Um, but yeah, so that's more so what I do today um, is just kind of troubleshoot and I make this system more efficient. But it's still very much, all of us that do my role, the system analyst role within this team have all um, industrial engineering backgrounds and ha always have before me. Uh, so, because it's kind of the perfect place because essentially we're doing industrial engineering just from the system side. Uh, so, with that, um, I don't have anything else specific to talk about. Uh, do you guys have any questions for me? Um, it was very random. So the question is, what made you interested in industrial engineering? Yes. Um, it was kind of random and obscure. So I went to college deciding between engineering and um, business. And my engineering, or my counselor at the time, like I went in to go talk to him about biomedical engineering actually, and he kept giving me industrial engineering information. And I was sort of like, this isn't what I came to talk to you about. Like, I wanted to get a professor to talk to you about biomedical. And um, long story short, I wasn't going to do engineering. And then right before I went back to school my sophomore year, I was unpacking things and repacking to go back to school. And I came across my industrial engineering info that that counselor gave me just randomly uh, and changed my major that day and have been doing it ever since. So sometimes you never know when. <laughs> Somebody might see something in you that you didn't even see. <laughs> yep. Are you glad you changed your major? Yes. Yeah, I was um, slated to go pre-business, and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with that. Like, I've always, I was always really, really good at math and enjoyed science. Um, so I was thinking I'll be like an accountant or something. But sitting at a desk in front of data all day and not really talking to anyone wasn't overly appealing for me. Um, so that is the one good thing about industrial engineering is you are kind of like a support group. So if you do like to work with people, um, you work with people a lot. Uh, and you're always kind of working between business groups and engineering groups because you kind of meld it together because you understand the technical side um, but can also speak the business side because for IE they have you take like economics and accounting and um, other business classes like that, communication classes. So. Anything else? All right, so if you knew now, or if you knew then what you know now, if you were them, what would you tell yourself? So if you were sitting in that chair right now, what would you, what advice would you give to yourself? I said, I give myself, have I knew about industrial engineering before? Well, more so just, just life like, and education in engineering. Um, I think I probably would have paid more attention in my intro to engineering class in college and or maybe like didn't have to take that class because um, I did not have any exposure to engineering before going to college. Um, I actually only came across it because my grandfather was an electrical engineer and right before going to school he's like, hey, you should look in engineering and I was like, what is that? Um, so I took a very basic intro class and but having had taken something like this, I probably would have known right off the bat. Um, potentially what engineering I wanted to do and and or at least a couple of them I was interested in to look more further into in school. All right, and then last question. So as you guys can see up there, so Amy got her bachelor's uh, from Wisconsin-Madison just after high school, like a normal person, right? However, her master's, so she, she went back to get her master's after several years of work. So mm -hmm. can you explain uh, what the logic was there and kind of that pathway? Um, well, mine worked out because I got a job outside of or right outside of college. So I did internships during college, both with Intel, um, and they wanted to hire me on full time. So I didn't have to have a master's, uh, and I had a job waiting for me. Um, so I think internships are really important. They're important because it can give you a step up uh, on top of everyone else, as well as give you an in to a company you might want to work for. 
um, and it also gives you a really good idea of whether you think you're going to like what you're going to be doing or not. Um, that's also important because you might try an internship and not like it at all, right? Then maybe that means you don't want to do the major you're doing. Um, but I, so I didn't need to, uh, but then just as I was working, I was starting to get a little bit bored. Um, the economy wasn't so great, so it wasn't a good time to look for a job. And Intel actually pays for part of uh, like degrees if you want to go get further schooling. Uh, so I decided to get my master's. Um, I did my master's in engineering management because uh, I've always wanted to kind of go the management route. Uh, and so I, that was kind of the next best thing to an MBA for me. Uh, but that's pretty much why I did it. I was just a little bit bored and thought it would be helpful in the future to get me ahead in the management role. Uh, and it helped that Intel would pay for part of it too. So, so yeah. All right, fair enough. Any other questions for Ms. Heinz? All right, thank you. Thanks. All right, great. So, as we've already made very clear, tonight we're talking about industrial and manufacturing engineering. So let me get there, but fundamentally, I want to ask you guys a question. Who here has worked on a team project before? Everybody, right? They shove them down your throat like crazy every semester, right? No matter whether you want them or not, right? So, you were up late on, it was due Monday morning, right? And you were up late on Sunday because you were waiting all weekend for Benjamin to get you his part. So you were sitting around and waiting on Sunday night and then you immediately got your part done and you kicked it off and then the person didn't finish it. You guys all got a late grade on Monday morning, right? So hopefully that didn't happen to you, but let's think about that process, right? So one person took too long and you had to just sit around. You wasted your whole weekend checking email every 15 minutes waiting for it to come in. So you wasted your entire weekend with nothing to show for it, right? And then you finally did your part and you kicked it off and the person wasn't paying attention and didn't get processed, right? Hopefully that hasn't happened to anyone, but that would be what we call a very inefficient process, right? Not only is it inefficient, but you also failed, right? So really manufacturing engineering, you guys have all been kind of a part in, right? You understand the line in which things have to get done, right? So let's think about this from an efficiency standpoint, right? Your job as a manufacturing and industrial engineer is to take parts or whatever you're making from the raw material, assemble them or change them somehow and get them out of the factory. How are you going to do that, Andrew? So the question is, you have a whole bunch of raw materials and you have to get those raw materials manufactured and out the door. How are you going to do that? So your options, how about this? Your options are you can take all of the parts and you can build them. Yeah. And then so you can take all the parts, you can build, take your Lego set, you can build your Lego set, and then you can take the Legos away. And then you can take another Lego set and build the Lego sets, take it away. Or you can build part of the Lego set, hand it to JROM. You can build part of the Lego set, hand it to JROM, who then builds part of the Lego set, hands it down the line, hands it down the line. Which do you think is a better option? Part of it, and why is that? Correct. You're collectively working together. And you become very, very, very good at building your one part, right? And he becomes very, very good at building his one part. Now, if you guys were to switch, that probably wouldn't work as well because he would have to relearn how to do it. But then you do it, and you do it, and Madison does it, and finally we're all done, right? So down the chain, down the line. All right, so these are the type of problems that manufacturing industrial engineers deal with every day. It's really about finding where the inefficiencies are, and just like Amy said, going through decreasing the inefficiency and optimizing the entire process. Right? The problem is, as opposed to your case that I talked about of your group wasting time and making you waste your whole weekend, your corporation just wasted a whole bunch of money. Right? And again, remember what happens if our company starts losing money? What happens to our jobs? Right. They don't, they don't last long. All right? So, questions we have to ask ourselves are how can we optimize to save money and improve output 
how, was, how must we design the factory such that resources can be used more efficiently? And how should we best run to optimize factory output? Okay, so what is manufacturing? Right? What do I mean when I say manufacturing? Right? It's pretty basic. It means to make something. Right? We all get that. Right? But we don't care just about making something. We don't care about making one batch of cookies as engineers. Right? We care about making a whole bunch of batches of cookies over and over and over again forever so that we can continue to sell those cookies. Right? This is what we call industrial manufacturing. So your role in this as an industrial, and manu as an industrial engineer is to set up that process to make sure that it works. As a manufacturing engineer, it's to make that actually run. Okay? So what we're going to do, so let's consider the case where we are, so right in here we have a paintbrush. Okay? So let's think about this, right? So I'm going to give you the paintbrush. You don't actually have to take it, right? I'm going to give you the paintbrush, and you're going to do something to change the paintbrush. Then you're going to pass it down the line, and you're going to do something to change the paintbrush. And you're going to pass it down the line. Okay? The work that you, you are what we call a workstation. And you are a workstation. And you are a workstation, and you are a workstation. And the way it works is we pass the item, whatever it is, the piece that we're working on, from workstation to workstation, workstation, workstation. Okay? And what you do, what each one of you guys is going to do at that workstation, we call an activity. Does that make sense? So in this case, if it had to go through you, 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 and you, the four of you, in order to get through the line, how many activities would there be in the process? Four. And how many workstations would there be in the process? Four. Correct. Okay. So each individual activity is, is done at what we call a workstation. Now, the workstation doesn't just have to be a person, right? It could be a robot. It could be a storage station, right? That's actually a real thing. You have to sometimes store stuff. Okay. So material, or your item, right? Material is going to move from workstation to workstation going through activity to activity. So we're all familiar with the concept of a process. We already talked about that in last week, material energy balances, right? Um, so what we're going to do in, sorry, I got off here. Yeah, so the manufacturing process itself is the four of you. Everything that's done that needs to create that product from beginning to end, okay? You're going to continue to march through the line one by one. All right, so in this case, let's consider the process of doing laundry, right? Everybody here has hopefully done laundry at some point, or at least is familiar with the concept of doing laundry, right? So you're going to take your dirty laundry, you're going to throw it in the washing machine. The washing machine is going to wash it, and then we put it in the dryer. After it comes out of the dryer, we need to fold it, and then out comes our clean laundry. But here's the question. Can we dry our clothes before we wash them? Well, you can, but then you have to go back and wash them again, right? So the idea in the manufacturing process is that it's a linear, and I use that term loosely, but it's a continuous and linear line, right? You have to go through A before you can go through B, before you can go through C, before you can go through D, right? Again, you wouldn't want to fold your laundry before you throw it in the washing machine because then you just wasted a whole bunch of time, right? Very, very basic concept, but I think you guys get it, right? So this is what we call being um, continuous and dependent, right? So the production line, this is how we model it. And again, these operations or the workstations, we call them operations. Okay, it's a C production line, right? This is like the Model T stuff you guys learned about, assembly line, whatever you want to call it. Production line is a series of workstations that are connected linearly. Now, between each workstation is something called a buffer. Now, that buffer is essentially a weight point. So what that means is, let's think about it from this perspective, perspective, right? Let's say that you can create 10 pencils a minute, but you can only write with five pencils a minute. What's going to happen in this case? One thing is you have to sit and wait. Either you have to sit and wait while he feeds you, and then what do you do? You're sitting around and waiting for him to be open, or he can produce his 10, five stack up while your five go out. Make sense? Okay. So that's what we call a buffer step. And really, the buffer step, nothing happens at a buffer step. It's just a place for stuff to sit. Right? So the production line, again, like we said, is sequential. Things have to happen in a particular order. 
And then operations are dependent because the operation cannot start until the previous operation is finished, right? So again, in the case of the laundry, can we start drying our clothes until the wash cycle is complete? No, the washer has to go, bzzz, you have to stop, you have to take it out, you have to put it in the dryer, and then you can start the dryer, right? So what we'd want in an ideal case is a continuous cascade of product, right? Okay, so we also use something called, who's heard of first in, first out? A couple of you have heard of first in, first out? Okay, what's that, what does that mean? You've heard the term, but you don't know what it means? All right, fair enough. So first in, first out, or what we call FIFO, is the best way to manufacture products in an overall line. And what it means is that the first part to enter the process will be the first part to leave the process. And in an ideal case, no part will overtake another part. So it kind of goes like this, right? Our red part goes in, he moves out, then the blue one moves in, and they just move down the line, then the green one moves in, then the orange one moves in. So why, and you, you guys get it, the little dots will keep going, right? But why is this the ideal method of manufacturing? Any ideas? Madison, what do you think? They don't all get stuck at one station. Okay, very good. Any other ideas? It's organized so now you can put them together quickly. Okay, organized so you can put them together quickly. Yeah, very good, right? So yeah, you guys both nailed it. What this does is it ensures a smooth flow through the process, right? Plus it makes sure that, let's think about it, right? If red went in first, but it came out last, how much longer did red spend in the process? A lot longer than something else, right? And what we want is we want material to be in the line as little as possible, and why would we want material to be in the line as little as possible? Why? Less room. Okay, that's actually a good one. Less less room to make errors while making it. Why else? What do you think? What do you think, Dustin? What do you think? Why do you think that it's important to get material in and out as fast as possible? Doesn't overflow. Okay. So what I'm looking for here is just pure inventory, right? If stuff sits in there longer, what were you gonna say? You can create, well, you can create more, you all, you can still only create so much in a given time. But the question is, yeah, how, how long does it sit in there, right? So by having it in this order, what you're doing is you're minimizing the amount that you have to put into the process to begin with, right? Again, it's an in and, it's an in and out thing, right? If, we're, if we start skipping, we can get into the situation where we're actually putting in more than we're getting out, right? And we have stuff stranded. Okay, so. This brings us to the concept of work in progress or WIP. Okay, so WIP is a physical thing, right? In the case that we were talking about earlier, WIP would be the pencil that we're making, right? I know it's easy to think of work in progress as something that we're doing or an action that we're taking, but we call WIP basically our thing that we're working on, our piece of inventory, right? So inventory then is the catch-all term for the amount of WIP located at any given portion of the process. So if I have 10 pencils at you, your inventory at your operation is how much? 10, right? And if I have five at you, how much is the inventory at your station? Five. And how much is the inventory at the entire process? 15, yeah, very good, right? So the entire process would have 15, you would have five, and he would have 10 if that was the case. All right, so if you can go to page 64 of your, oh, I want to clarify one thing real quick. The inventory at a buffer step, so remember that buffer step is the step in between two stations. The inventory at a buffer step belongs to, so let's, let's put it in this example here, right? So Chandler had t was making 10 pencils and you were making five pencils. The five pencils that are sitting here waiting for you to work on them, who does that belong to, do you think? Him? No, it's yours, because it's waiting for you to do it. Right, so the inventory goes to you, right? So a buffer step, the inventory to buffer step belongs to the downstream process, or the downstream operation, okay? So if you go to please page 64 in your book, given the process flow shown, where each one of those dots indicates a piece of whip, determine the inventory of operation A, of operation B, of operation C, <coughs> and then the inventory within the entire process. 
All right, you have it? You ready to go? All right, what'd you get for operation A? Um, one. One? Did everybody agree? I agree. All right, how about operation B? What'd you get? Four. Everybody agree? Four? Why is it four? There's only one sitting at B. Yeah, the buffer has three in it waiting for B to process. So B is responsible for four. How about operation C? Five, Five because it's four plus one, right? And then how about the entire process? 10. All right, you guys are all officially industrial and manufacturing engineers. You got it down. All right, so we're going to measure. So we were talking earlier about the rate, right? We had Chandler feeding JROM at a much faster rate, right? So we're going to measure that rate is something we call capacity and throughput. Throughput is very simply the rate at which something moves through the operation. All right, so in this case, it's the average output over time. Capacity, and that's was, I remember if you guys recall, Amy's job title was capacity coordinator. Capacity is the maximum possible output of a process or of an operation, right? So capacity is the total amount that you could possibly do. And throughput is the actual measured amount that you're doing, right? So in this case, JROM's doing five, but what if JROM was supposed to be doing seven? JROM's capacity would be seven, but he'd only be performing at five. So his throughput would be five. His capacity would be his maximum possible, which is if he didn't drink, sleep, or eat, or anything like that, right? If he didn't do anything except make pencils all day, he could be at seven. But because he's a real human being, he's a real machine, he can only make five, okay? All right, so. Let's consider the widgetmatic. I promised you guys earlier we'd talk about the widgetmatic, right? Machine can produce a widget every five minutes. The throughput of the widget making operation is thus 12 units per hour. Why is that? Because of math, right? If I can make one widget every five minutes, that means that the widgetmatic should be able to produce 12 widgets per hour. Or we could go and we could figure it out per week, or per month, or per year, et cetera, right? Now, however, what if we had 10 widgetmatics on our factory floor? What would our throughput be? All we do is we just multiply it by the number of machines that we have, and now all of a sudden our factory is now capable of 120, right? Pretty simple. Throughput times the number of machines is going to give you your total factory throughput. So if we go, please, to page 65, a cutting machine can process a unit every 15 minutes. What is the weekly capacity if the factory runs for A, eight hours on weekdays only? Or you just remind me, how many weekdays are there? Five weekdays, that's correct. And then B, if it runs 24 by seven. Okay, so let's take two minutes, quick math. I don't think you need a calculator, but if you want one, go for it. Yeah, what do you have for the first one? 160 units. So how did you get 160 units? OK, perfect. So how many it can make per hour, which is 4 times 60 minutes. Or in this case, I did one for one for one by 15 times 60, which is the same. That's four times eight hours times five days equals 160 units per week. Very, very good. All right, and Chandler, what'd you get for B? 672, that is also what I got. So again, you just multiply it by 24 hours times seven days. Nicely done, sir, right? Pretty simple, yes, sir. Um, so I think it depends on your metric. I, what I've largely seen stuff measured in is uh, generally uh, there's two. There's per hour, and then there's per week, right? Because you want to know what your total. Generally, you want to know what your factory is shipping per week, on the whole. Um, usually, when you look at it on pieces, like at, in our job, when we look at it on pieces of equipment, it tends to be uh, both per hour, and then we measure things in per week. But it's actually by shift, by 12-hour shift. So you look at out, we'll look at like outs per shift will be one of our metrics, uh, but that actually gets normalized to our weekly run rate, right? Because you know how many shifts there are per week, so you'll just normalize that. And that's what we get drug into the room and yelled out about. So, all right. So now we're going to get into a little more complicated stuff than what we've been doing. So we're going to talk about cycle time. And this is really the bread and butter of the manufacturing engineer, okay? 
Cycle time is the total time on average, and that's important on average, that it takes to complete an operation or to go through a process from start to finish. Cycle time includes both the processing time during which we're actually working on it and the wait time that parts spend in the buffer. Okay, so think about that, right? If it took me two minutes to process something, but something had to sit in the waiting room for an hour, it's still, you're still, so say I'm a doctor, right? You're at the doctor's office. You have to sit and wait for an hour for me. But then I see you for 10 minutes. Do I go home at the end of the day and said, man, I got that patient out in 10 minutes? The answer is no, because that patient still spent an hour and 10 minutes waiting, right? Okay. So the cycle time for the operation is the average time that spends processing or waiting. And this is the amount of time for what we call move out to move in. Right? If it moves out at 8 o'clock, so again, in the doctor's example, right? if you left at 1.15 and you got there at noon, you still spend an hour and 15 minutes there. It doesn't matter how long the doctor spent with you. Right? That's still the time it costs to process the patient. And then the cycle time for process is the total time on average it takes to go through the entire process. All right, so again, in our example that we're using with you guys, right? Chandler will have one, JRAM will have one, and you will have one and you will have one, right? And then we also have the process time, which is the time from Chandler start to Izzy finish, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Easy enough? All right, so now we're gonna look at a two-step widget manufacturing process. In this case, we still have our widget Matic, which is five minutes per widget, but we also now have the widget wash. So the widget wash, so again, we're start, going to start to see a lot of concepts that we've already talked about in previous classes come back. The widget wash is a batch unit. So what the watch, widget wash does is it processes five units at a time, but it takes 25 minutes to do a batch of five. Okay? So the cycle time of the fabrication is relatively straightforward. Each widget takes five minutes to process and then moves on to washing. So the cycle time of the widget Matic is what? How's how many? Five, right? Takes five minutes to process, right? So from start to finish takes five minutes. Okay? However, let's look at the cycle time of the washing operation because it's actually not as clear. Okay, so widgets arrive at this operation one at a time, but they process as a batch. So how long does it take for one widget to process in my washer? How many? Five. No, there's, there's, it takes five? Right, so in my washer, I'm taking five of them, putting them in, and then they wash for 25 minutes. So you're right, if I were to do how many widgets do I get, right, my rate would still be five per 25 or one per five, but the actual time that it spends in the widget wash is how much? 25, but there's a little more to it than that as well, right, because we have to include the wait time. Right, so again, remember, our process is continually feeding as we go, right? That widget wash, every, or the widget Matic, right? The one making the widgets, every five minutes, it's pumping another widget out of the line. Every five minutes. So if that washer is in the middle of a cycle, the first one that arrives has to sit there and wait for how long? Up to, up to 25 minutes, right? So again, now going back to the doctor's example, right? Even though it only takes 25 minutes for that widget to process in the widget Matic, it might have to wait up to 25 minutes to actually go into the washer. So what we see is a widget five that shows up, the fifth one, has no wait time because as soon as it shows up we can create a batch of five. The fourth one that shows up has to wait five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and twenty minutes. So what we actually see is if you add up the total cycle time, you get 175 minutes, but then you divide that by five and what do we actually get? The average cycle time in the widget Matic is 35 minutes. Right? So even though it only takes 25 minutes to process, because you have a weighted wait time in the buffer unit, once you add all that up, you actually get a 35-minute average cycle time. Does that make sense? I see a couple furrowed brows. What are the questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Any questions? All right, I'm going to assume all those furrowed brows are just because it's way too bright in here and I'm making perfect sense. Then. Okay, great. All right, so let's explore this in a much simpler example. Go to page 66, please. So given the process below, or shown in this case, determine the cycle time of operation B and the cycle time for the entire process. 
So again, we need to consider the time that stuff spins in the buffer. Okay? Rachel, are you going to do this one for me? Operation B cycle time is five minutes. Does everybody agree on that? Yes, question. Uh, wouldn't it be eight because there's three sitting and waiting for Okay, eight minutes. So we've got five minutes. We've got eight minutes. What's everybody else think? What do you think, Benjamin? Well, the buffer doesn't have to be full. Buffer doesn't have to be full. Fair enough. All right, so let's let's work it, let's let's work through it together, right? So, what I have is that operation B processing times five minutes, but a part has to sit in the buffer for fifteen minutes, right? It's a three-part buffer, right? And again, we're first in, first out, so everything has to sit in for the full time. Okay, so the average cycle time for operation B is thus five minutes plus fifteen minutes. Cycle time is twenty minutes. Okay. The cycle time for the full process then is what? So again, B is 20 and A is 5. Right, because you're still only, you're still only, you can only, you only move a widget out every 5 minutes, right? So that means that a new widget leaves the buffer and a new widget enters the buffer every, right? It's, it's N equals out, right? So the buffer lee, or a widget leaves and at the same time a widget's entering. So you know that it has to sit in there for three moves, three move durations, which is how much? 15 minutes. Yep. So the cycle time for the full process then, knowing now that our cycle time of operation B is 20 minutes, what's our cycle time for the full process? What's that? 25 minutes. Do I agree? I do. So cycle time of operation B is 20 minutes, cycle process, the process cycle time. All right, so we already kind of talked about this earlier with JRAM being a real human being and not being able to just work 24 by 7, right? It's unrealistic to expect not only JRAM, of course, but equipment to work 24 by 7, right? If you guys were driving your car and you just went down the road and turned your car on and drove it and you were going to drive for forever, eventually what would happen? Run out of gas, tire would go flat, something would break, right? Right. So it's, of course, unreasonable to expect stuff to operate continuously and indefinitely, although don't tell Miss Industrial Engineer back that. They want us to run all the time, but no, that's not true. All right, so all physical assets, whether it be machines, equipment, or people, require some form of maintenance during their life. The assumption that the piece of equipment that you bought is going to run 24 by 7, 365 days a year for its entire life is just going to mean that you are going to buy way less than you need in your factory and you're going to end up with output problems. Okay, you're not going to be able to meet your production quotas. So what we define as uptime is the period of time which the material or the machine is actually able to do what it's supposed to do. Okay, pretty simple concept there. This is the opposite, of course, of downtime, which is the time that an equipment is not able to do what it's supposed to do. Right? For you guys, downtime would be what? When you're sleeping or when you're playing Destiny, right? Or whatever I heard you guys talking about. All right, so availability, availability is actually my lifeblood, right? I hit my availability targets, and if I don't, I don't get promoted, right? So I've done a very good job over my career of hitting my availability targets. It's always what I've been very good at, right? Very luckily for me. So simply put, availability is the percentage of time the machine is able to perform it versus the total amount of time. So it's very simply, the great thing about this, manufacturing engineering doesn't require a ton of math. It's fantastic, right? Availability equals uptime divided by uptime plus downtime because uptime plus downtime equals all the time in the world. You're either up or you're down, right? So we generally express this as a percentage, um, which I realize is somewhat counterintuitive to what we talked about in reliability engineering where we always did it as a uh, a decimal, right? Right. Remember, 90% was 0 0.9 in reliability. Um, but that's just the way we do it in the industry. That's just the industry standard. And you do even multiply the availabilities, so you have to actually move them back to being a 0.9. But when you go into the meeting and you explain air availability, you do it in a percentage. I'm up 90% of the time. All right. So 61 in your book, please. A cleaning machine goes down every day for 50 minutes 
to fill the soap reservoir once a week for eight hours for quality checks, and then down again four hours at the end of every month for tuning and calibrations. What is the average availability for this machine? Yes? Page 67? All right, sorry, page 67 in your book, please. All right, so again, what we have here is we have a cleaning machine, and I've given you what we call its maintenance schedule. So its maintenance schedule is 50 minutes a day, eight hours weekly, and then four hours monthly. Okay, so how we're going to calculate this is we're going to take the availability for the month as being, let's assume it's a 30-day month, right? 30 times 24 minus 30 times 50 divided by 60, right? Why is it 50 divided by 60? Because that's minutes per hour, right? Minus 4 times 8, which is our 4 weeks per month, times 8 hours per week, minus 4 times 1, which is 4 hours times once a month, all over 30 times 24. So what I did on the top there, right, is instead of adding it all up, I'm at, because I'm taking downtime, I'm taking availability, I'm taking total time minus the downtime divided by the total time, right? And what we get is availability for the month of 0 0.915 or 91.5%. Okay, pretty simple concept. All right, so now let's talk about capacity. Capacity, remind me, what's capacity? What's that? You said it. Right, the maximum amount of stuff that our factory can produce. You're correct. Can we ever run at capacity? Probably not. Why is that? Yeah, there's always going to be a loss or something. Yep, you're correct. So a manufacturing facility can never be expected to perform at its maximal possible capacity for any expanded duration. We could probably do it for a couple hours a day maybe if we were all focused and everybody took their bathroom breaks at the same time and we went in and we hit it hard, then we all went to lunch at the same time, right? But we still wouldn't be able to do it all day long. So when we're designing a facility, and this is really what Amy's job is, right? When designing a facility, she has to take realistic capacity calculations into account. The design capacity is the theoretical maximum capacity. So the design capacity would be just what you said, the maximum possible that we could do forever if we worked as hard as we could forever and never had to stop. The effective capacity is a maximum capacity of a process under normal conditions. So in the previous example that we just did, we looked at a machine that had to go down every so often, er, er, had to go down a couple times a day, go down once a week, go down once a month, probably has an annual maintenance that needs done on it as well, right? So in this case, for effective capacity, we would take all that into account and budget that in and say, okay, that piece of equipment, remind me, was like what, 91.5% availability, I think, was our example? So in that case, we would say, all right, this piece of equipment, we only expect to be up 91.5% of the time. So what we would do is we'd say, if our maximum capacity is 1,000, we would expect our maximum capacity, to, or our effective capacity to be actually what? 915. Right? We're saying we expect this to be down this much. Then, of course, we get to actual output, which is what we actually get out. And again, because as you so eloquently said, basically stuff happens, right? You're never going to see an actual output that is your effective, right? It's very, hard, very difficult to do that, okay? Because again, things break when you don't expect them to. It happens. All right, so from capacity standpoint, in your process, there's always going to be a limiter in your chain. There's always going to be a limiter somewhere, right? Whether it be Chandler, whether it be JLROM, whatever, right? One of you guys is going to be slower than the rest. And what's going to happen at that station? What's that? It's, it's going to have a big buffer. Yes, yeah, stuff's yeah, exactly. It's going to accumulate inventory. Right? Because not only is our whole process a material balance, but each one of these stations is a material balance. Right? If he's putting out a lot more stuff than she can handle, she's going to get a big old pile of pencils right here. Right? And then we're going to start expanding and eventually we're going to explode. Okay? So she is what we would call in this case the bottleneck. The bottleneck is literally a term, right? It's because, I mean, you guys have all had a bottle. We have a bottle right here. All right? If I were to cut this off, I could drain this super fast, right? But the bottleneck 
prevents it, it's the constriction, right? It prevents this from going out as fast and it'll slow it down, right? So that's what we consider the bottleneck is your pinch point effectively in your process. So because your bottleneck, right, she can only, she's the limiter. She can only produce so many things per day. So does it matter? Thank you. Does it matter how much Chandler's producing? If he's producing 100 and she's only producing five, what's our process getting out? Five, right? So do we need to go yell at Chandler because he's not being effective enough? I mean, maybe, maybe he could be producing 150, so maybe he gets scolded. But our biggest problem is right here, right? This is what we're going to go attack. And again, Amy showed you guys that big wheel that she was looking at, that iterative process. So that's what she's going to do. That's what we're going to do in this process. We're going to say, where's our problem? It's right here. We're going to analyze and we're going to improve this point. And then we're going to say, OK, we've improved it. So now all of a sudden, like let's say now she's running at 15, but JRAM's only running at 10. Now who's our new bottleneck? JRAM, right? Now you're getting your butt pulled into the meeting and yelled at, right? That's the way it works, okay? So bottleneck is the important area of focus for improving capacity. So let's go look at now our fully effective widget making process. Let's consider the three operation widget making process shown below. So we have the widget Matic. Again, our cycle time is five minutes and he can make 72 per day. The polisher can make 30 or has a cycle time of 30 minutes, which means 48 widgets per day. And the washer has a cycle time of 15, so it has 96 widgets per day. So which of these three is our bottleneck and why? Which one? The polisher? The polish shot? Yeah, the polisher, right? The polisher is the bottleneck. And very simply, why? Because it makes the least. So the smooth widget is the, or the polishing operation is our limiter. All right, so 68, that's got to be right, because it's way higher than, six, it's higher than 67. So on 68, very quickly here, identify the bottleneck in the process shown. What is the weekly capacity? Now this one's your cumulative problem as well, because I want to point out there's availabilities on those guys. So we have to take the availability into account. All right, Benjamin, did you get it? OK, that's fair. All right, so let's go through it together, all right? So what we need to do in order to do this, because as Malika said, right, we have higher availability, but the process takes longer, right? So what's actually going to get out more? So if we break it down, the bottleneck is the operation with the lowest throughput. So if we go through and we do the calculation, A can produce three th just over 3,000 per week, 3,024. B can produce 1854.7, which means it can produce 1854. And Operation C can produce 4,284. So now looking at the total throughput by operation, which operation is our bottleneck? Yeah, the answer is right up there. It's B, right? The one that's lowest is our bottleneck. So now the question is, what is our process output? What's that? Yeah, so again, it has to go from operation A, then to operation B, then to operation C. So how much can we get out of our process per week? 1,854. 1,854, that's correct, right? We can only produce as much as our weakest link, right? The slow kid slows us all down, right? Okay? So yes, right here is our process bottleneck. All right, so this brings us to our engineering application, which is the theory of constraints. Theory of constraints is going to be your bread and butter as an industrial engineer and as a manufacturing engineer. And this is a circular process. My diagram looks far less nicer than Amy's did, but it's the same concept. So what you're going to do at first is you're going to identify the constraint. You're going to say, where is my slow point? Then you're going to do everything you can to maximize constraint capacity. I was literally doing this in a meeting at 4.15 this afternoon. Right? My module has become a factory problem. We're a factory limiter. So we're going through and figuring out how we could rebalance our module, rebalance our tool settings to try to better balance the line and manage the two processes that we're running within our module. Right? We're taking a little bit from one process and moving it onto the other process so that we can try to rebalance. Okay? 
Then we are going to align all other steps to the constraint, and that's exactly what we were doing. We say this one type of chemistry that we use on this one process is way constrained and we cannot get outs on it. So we, even though we were performing well on a different chemistry, we took some of the availability from that chemistry and moved it into the chemistry that was in trouble. Okay? So we said it doesn't matter that this other chemistry can perform really well because we can still only get out what we get out through the low guy, so we took some and repurposed it. Okay? We'll then do everything we can to increase constraint, constraint capacity. I have a new tool set that's coming online in about five weeks. That's what we're trying to do to increase capacity. And then we're going to repeat the symbol, we're going to repeat the cycle because what happens when I bring on that new tool set in a couple weeks? I'm not going to be the limiter anymore. Now maybe I have to go back and reshift capacity around to rebalance out the other chemistry. Right? And then we're going to keep doing that until we can, actually there is no until. You keep doing that forever. No matter what, no matter how good you're running, somebody is always the slow kid, right? You always have to go find the slow kid and help the slow kid get faster, right? That's just the way it works, and that's your job. And that's good because it keeps you employed. If you could just go turn a knob and fix it, then they wouldn't need to keep you around much longer, right? So you keep attacking the problem and keep improving the problem. All right, so capacity planning. I can hear Amy in the back getting all excited because capacity planning was what she did up until like three months ago. Right, so this is the process of determining the amount of resources that are required to supply the capacity you need to meet the production goals. So Intel right now, Intel is exceedingly constrained. We cannot make enough chips. Our, if supply, our, our customers want as many chips as we can make. So right now we're in the process of building out the factory. Right? That was announced a couple months ago that we're increasing capacity on Hillsborough campus. I'm in the process of hiring people like crazy to make that happen. Right? That's a good thing. But in the process of doing that, somebody said to say, all right, our customers are going to buy X. In order to buy X, we need to buy Y number of tools and Z number of tools, and we need to employ A number of people, right? All that's been planned out through capacity planning. So, but here's the thing, right? Because manufacturing facilities operate around the clock, 24 by 7, I can't create more time. And that's actually the biggest problem that we have, right? If you were working, let's say, eight-hour days, you could just say, oh, let's work overtime, right? Oh, we need to get out. I need to get some extra homework done. I'll just stay up until 11 o'clock, right? I'm sure you guys have done that a time or three, right? But I can't do that in my factory because there's no extra time. So anything that we lose is just gone, okay? So that's insufficient capacity because we can't work overtime leads to misorders. If we can't get stuff to our customers, they're going to go look for it elsewhere, and then they're not going to be buying our stuff anymore in the future, and we just lost a customer. Right? So we need to make sure that that's effectively planned, and we have to make sure that it's not a barrier to our profitability. Because if you can't get out what you need to get out, tell somebody you're going to get them 1,000, you want to get them 500, you're going to have a lot of unhappy people. So capacity planning, let's again revisit our full operation for our widgets. Right. In this case, we have 72 per day on the widget, Matic, 48 per day on the polish, and 96 on the washer. But now let me ask you this question. Somebody comes and Benjamin's company, Benjamin Co., says, I need 200 widgets per day. Can I make 200 widgets per day with my process? <coughs> is it my process that it can't make 200 per day? Or is it my equipment that can't make 200 per day? Equipment, very good answer, right. So I need to buy more equipment. So how many do I need? Okay, so I can make 72 widgets per day on the widget matic. How many widget matics would I need to be able to make 200 per day? Three? Why is that? Isn't that only like 2.8? Why can't I just buy 2.8 machines? You have to buy a full machine. Yeah, that's right. All right. Now, polish. How many polishers do I need? Is it five? Am I gonna make, am I gonna make 200? All right, very good, right? And why does it have to be five? Because four is how many? It's about eight short, right? So that's where you really, actually, that's where you're like the happy engineer is when you have way more capacity than you need, then you're happy, okay? And then the washer, how many washers do I need? Three, and why is that? Because then I'm gonna be about eight short, right? <laughs> yeah, very good, so, right? So right now, the polisher guy is super happy, he has a bunch of extra capacity. The washer guys are super happy, they have a bunch of extra capacity. But what, about the, what about the widget guy? How much capacity does he have? He's going to have 216, right? Did I do my math right? You don't know? <laughs> 72 times 3? So he's going to have a little extra. 
right? But is he going to have a lot of extra? No. So if factory management suddenly gets another order, J JRAM Co. comes in and they ask for another 50, who's getting drug into the meeting and yelled at to increase production? The first guy, right? The fabricator. All right. So again, you guys all did this in your head because they were nice, right? So we need three machines on the Widgetmatic. We need five machines of the polisher and we need three machines. So now our production line looks like this, right? We have three Widgetmatics. We have five polishers and we have three washers and we've increased it to what's our total process output? 216 is the correct answer, right? Doesn't matter I can make 288 on the washers. Doesn't matter that I can do 240 on the polishers. We can only create 216 per day. Okay. All right. So you guys are now all officially industrial manufacturing engineers. Do we have any questions? before we move into tonight's super awesome lecture, or super awesome lab where we get to play with Legos. Yeah, see, so, you know, I got a couple of people just got excited there, I like it. All right, any other questions for myself or for uh, Amy, who's done this forever? Okay, so let's take five minutes, please. Uh, I, uh, guys at the center table, I actually do need you guys to move, please, because we're using the center table for our production line and um, give us a couple minutes to get set up and then we'll get started. <laughs> 